So, all right, let's get into this. Question. Have you ever been lost? Just raise your hand. Have you ever been lost? That should be pretty much all of us. I want to tell you about a time that I was lost. Um, I was in student ministry, and this was several years ago, and this was before the age of iPhones and maps and directions and all of that. So um, you guys remember like MapQuest and all of that? Yeah. And some of you guys are like, I have no idea what that is. Good for you. So I was in student ministry, and every year we would go to this thing called Night of Joy or Rock the Universe, which is at Disney World and Universal Studios. And they would kick everybody out of the park um, about 6 o'clock or so and let people in. And from 6 o'clock to about midnight, they have all of these big-time Christian bands like Elevation Worship, Brandon Lake, uh, Toby Mac, and all of these big Christian bands would come in and set up, and they would have concerts all around the park, and kids could ride rides. So every year we would go to this. Well, it finishes at midnight, and then you have to go out and catch the tram or the ferry, and then get out to your vehicle, leave, and I mean, it was, it was late. And see, we would leave on Friday morning. We would gather up a van full of students. There must have been like 30 of those kids in this one van. At least it seemed that way anyway. And we would drive all the way up to Orlando. We'd do a theme park all the way. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't leave there until close to, you know, 1 a.m., and, of course, we were all hungry at that point, and I was completely jacked up on Cuban coffee because I found this place that sells Cuban coffee in Disney World, which was like the greatest gift from God ever, right? Because I like to stay alive when I'm driving a bunch of kids around. And so we're, we're all just, you know, having a blast, and we run through a 24-hour McDonald's, and I'm like, yeah, I'll take 30 cheeseburgers, Literally, I said that, and they're like, I'm sorry. And I said, no, 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 we're a youth group, and they, they, they thought we were joking. So we got like 30 cheeseburgers, and we're eating, and we're, we're driving to the hotel. We hadn't been to the hotel yet because we had to go straight to the theme park because we drove all the way from the Keys. And so we're driving around, and I'm like, where is this place? And I'm looking at the directions I had printed out, and, and, and we can't find it. And we're driving, I mean, it seemed like forever, probably wasn't quite forever, um, and we, we just cannot find this hotel. It, it was called the Leaky Tiki, which might have been part of the problem anyway, right, that I, I'm not known for my gift of choosing great hotels. Um, so anyway, here we are. It's probably 1, 1.30 a.m. at this time, and I'm driving a van full of students somewhere around Orlando have no clue where we are. And so I'm trying to call the hotel and get somebody on the line at 1.30 at this, of course, I picked the cheapest place around, right? I can't get anybody on the phone. Finally, we get somebody on the phone. And I said, hey, listen, we're supposed to check. Oh, yeah, Mr. Mann, I see your reservation here. Where are you guys? I'm like, I, I don't know. Please tell me how to get there. I need directions. And he's like, well, where are you? And I'm like, if I knew where I was, I wouldn't be here. I would be there. And he's like, no, 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 describe to me what you see. Tell me, tell me like what, are, and I said, well, okay, there's this shopping center and there's this and this store. And he goes, oh, are you on such and such street? And I'm like, I don't know, let me look. And we come to an intersection and I look and I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's all right. And he goes, he goes, oh. I'm like, what do you mean, oh? And he goes, oh, you don't want to be there right now. I'm like, what are you talking about? I've got a van full of teenagers. It's 1.30 in the morning. He goes, yeah, you need to turn around right now and come back the other way. I mean, it was like, he was like, that is a really, really bad part of town. So the, the end of the story is we all made it to the hotel finally. We made it back safe, but we were absolutely lost. And I needed help in getting out of that. Um, Speaking of lost things, this is a true story. Did you hear about the frog who lost his car? I mean, it turns out it wasn't lost. It was just towed. <laughs> Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. If you've got your Bibles, turn there. Like they said, I am known for my amazing dad jokes, and that was absolutely one of them. Um, I won't throw the person under the bus who actually found that joke for me this week. You know, and I have a certain, while you're turning there, it's very important here, I have a certain group of people in my life who often remind me how terrible my jokes are, and so I've recently said, okay, fine, then you guys are charged with getting me a joke every week so I can tell. So 
I'm sure the jokes will be so much better after this point. We're 0 for 1 already. So, my title for today is just simply Lost. Lost. We are going to look at a story that we all know, we've all heard. It's one of those Sunday school stories but has this really, really big meaning. Now, in Luke chapter 19, I want to kind of bring you up to speed on what's happening here. So we're in the final week of Jesus' life. All right, I mean, this is it. It's coming down to it. And Jesus is traveling from the north in Galilee all the way down to Jerusalem. And, and the main route that they normally took was through this town called Jericho. Everybody's heard of Jericho before. So they're going through Jericho so Jesus can get to Jerusalem for Passover and then actually become the sacrificial lamb for all mankind. That's what was happening here. And we have so many details of Jesus's final week from the four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they're all for an account from different perspectives of the life of Jesus. And we've got a, a lot of that is dedicated to Jesus's final week. Um, and and if you if you this is just kind of a freebie if you're ever uh, in Bible trivia here's here's some trivia for you um, only four chapters of all of the Gospels are dedicated to the first thirty years of Jesus's life we know that Jesus lived to be thirty three maybe thirty three and a half or so and so uh, four chapters were only only four were dedicated to his first thirty years eighty five chapters were dedicated to the last three and a half years of Jesus's life. And, and what was he doing during that time? That was his ministry years. He was going around preaching and teaching the gospel. Now, of those 85 chapters that we have about Jesus's last three and a half years, 29 of those chapters cover the last week of Jesus. That's pretty fast. To me, I'm, I'm like this Bible geek and stuff like that. And I'm like, 29 of those chapters cover the final week of Jesus' life, this one included. And there are 13 chapters in the four Gospels that are just dedicated to the last 24 hours and then post-resurrection of Jesus' life. So 13 chapters just for that final 24 hours. You think it's, that's an important time? I would say so. Now, what does this tell us? This tells us that the most important part of Jesus' life is not necessarily his teachings, although those were very good. Uh, maybe not even the life events that he was in, although those are very important. And, and not even the miracles that Jesus did, which were very, very important. This tells us that the most important part of Jesus' life is that he willingly died and was buried and resurrected three days later. That's why there's so much concentration and in, in so much time spent. That is the most important part of the Gospels. <clears throat> and guess what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important event in all of history. If we have no resurrection, we've got nothing. We are just like every other religion and faith and everything else that there is out there. And the really cool thing about Christianity, at least pure, true Christianity like we preach and teach here at Island Community Church, is we are the only ones who can, who can claim, hey, we had a Savior come to this earth to die for us, and the story doesn't end there. Three days later, he rose again. No one else can celebrate that. And we are, we are exclusive to that true Christianity, being a follower of Jesus, that is what we celebrate. So Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Now, Jericho is a, was, is a really, really interesting place. You can still go there today. It wasn't, it's not nearly what it used to be back then. Uh, but Jericho back then was kind of like the Vegas of the day. Okay, you know that whole what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Like, I mean, it was just known for money. It was known for, well, you could pretty much get whatever you wanted. It was known for commerce. It was known for riches. I mean, this was a, a big vacation spot where people would go. This was the really, really cool place, Jericho. Um, one writer said this about it. He said, it had a great palm forest and world-famous balsam groves which perfumed the air for miles around. Its gardens of roses were known far and wide. 
Men called it the city of palms. Josephus, and we talk about Josephus a lot, he was an ancient Jewish historian. He didn't really believe in Jesus or follow Jesus, but he was right after Jesus. And he called it this, he called it a divine region, the fattest in Palestine. The Romans carried its dates and balsam to worldwide trade and fame. So this is a happening place, Jericho. Verse two, a man was there by the name of, what's his name? Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, we got to talk about tax collectors, and most of you guys know this, so we won't spend a ton of time, but tax collectors were traitors to the Jewish people. They were absolutely hated, especially a chief tax collector as it describes uh, Zacchaeus here. Like, not only was he a regular tax collector who just basically extorted everyone, but he was in charge of a lot of other tax collectors. This guy was absolutely hated. He was extremely dishonest as pretty much, I, don't, I didn't know all of them back there, so I don't want to speak for everyone, but pretty much all tax collectors were just very dishonest and they were ripping off people. Um, in fact, Rome, they, they worked for Rome, so here's these Jews selling out their own people, working for Rome. Rome would say, hey, Jericho, this, this specific region, you have to raise X numbers of dollars for that reason, for, for that region. And that's pretty much how it went. So then Zacchaeus would say, oh, okay, we're going to have this tax, and we're going to have this tax, and we're going to have a cart tax. And if you have a cart, because a lot of them just had little businesses in a cart, they would sell things. Okay, if you have a cart, we're going to tax your cart. Um, if the cart has two wheels, we're going to tax each wheel that the cart has. Um, if the cart is pulled by an animal, we're going to tax that animal. We're, like they would tax everything. You think it's bad now? And it is, okay, but it was that bad back then. So Zacchaeus and tax collectors would raise however much they needed to raise for Rome, and then they would tack on all of these other things, and they would keep all of that for themselves. Now, would that guy be super popular? Probably not. He was absolutely hated and basically cast out uh, from being a Jew. He was a Jew by birth, but the Jews hated him. They did not see him as a Jew. Now, here's another Bible trivia. There's only two tax collectors in all of the Bible who are named. Zacchaeus is one. Who's the other one? Matthew, or Levi as it starts, and then we kind of start to call him Matthew. Not, nice job. 200 bonus points for you, whoever that was. Um, now, here's also something interesting. The word or the name Zacchaeus means righteous, pure, or innocent one? Do you think his parents were kind of shooting for the stars, but they, you know, fell a little bit short there? Because that's what they did when they named them. They're like, oh, I really hope he's righteous and pure and innocent. Uh, nope, didn't make it, did he? Back to verse 2. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, here's something really interesting that I noticed this week. That's chapter 19. In chapter 18, Jesus is confronted by someone else who is very wealthy, the rich young ruler, right? And for the most part, because Jesus knew his heart, because Jesus knew what was going to happen, Jesus said, oh, just, you know, just, just sell all of your things, you know, give it to the poor, follow me. And the guy, you know, just said, no, nah, I'm sorry, I can't do that. He went away sad. Jesus basically blew this guy off. I mean, he tried, but he was like, you know what? I'm not going to spend time on you because you're not going to get it. So here's a wealthy person in chapter 18. Jesus, he tries to give it to him. He doesn't want it. And Jesus is like, all right, next, next chapter, he finds this wealthy guy, Zacchaeus, and I don't mean to ruin the whole story here. I think you probably know it, but Jesus ends up inviting himself into Zacchaeus' house to go stay with him. So it's pretty interesting. What does that tell you about how much Jesus cares about riches and wealth? Or I'll ask it this way. Do you think Jesus cared about riches and wealth? Not a single bit. This tells us that Jesus really doesn't care. He doesn't care about how much money you have. He doesn't care about your status. He doesn't care about your accomplishments. 
He doesn't care about your mistakes as far as how he sees you. He loves each and every one of us the same. No one is ever too far gone. I love that about Jesus. There's a lot of other uh, fake Jesuses out there, if you will. That's not how my Jesus is. My Jesus loves everyone equally, no matter what. No one is too far gone. He doesn't care about wealth. He doesn't care about riches. Psalm 24, 1 Corinthians 10, both of those chapters say, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Guess what? It all belongs to him anyway. He doesn't care. What he cares about is your heart. Verse 3, he wanted to see who Jesus was, that's Zacchaeus, but because he was, what's that word? Short. We're talking about a really, really short guy here, and, and from what I understand, back then, nobody was super tall. Maybe Goliath, okay, but that was it. But most everyone else, from what a lot of scholars believe, is people were a little bit shorter back then. So if this guy was short among them, he was really, really short. So it says, because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. Now listen to this. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now I want to show you what kind of a tree that we think it is. Look at that. Isn't that tree beautiful? That is a sycamore fig tree, and I have learned this week it's a ficus sycamorus, in case you want to write that down if you're a botanist. But... This is the type of tree that is believed that it was. And you can see it's a very easily climbed tree. The roots, you know, come down and the trunk comes down and he could have gotten up to be above everybody else. Now, it's really important for us to picture this. It's important for us to see this tree and to picture this wealthy tax collector In some ways, he had status because of his wealth, because of his position, at least with the Roman government, not amongst the Jews. But I just, I really, I want you to picture him up on a branch. I don't know if he sat there with his legs dangling down. I don't know if he laid on it. I don't know. But he was up on this tree just trying to see Jesus. Now, and it says, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Now, I need you to understand this. Jewish men, especially rich Jewish men of status, don't run. Now, this this doesn't as much translate to us today, but, but you need to get this. They don't run, and they certainly did not climb trees. This would have been so out of the ordinary, Like, to to see this guy climb this tree would have just blown everyone's mind. I need us to understand that. Now, here's a question. Who does run and climb trees? That's right. I just had one raise their hand, all right? Kids do. Because running and climbing trees is awesome, right, kids? Those of you who guys are in here, I'm sorry that your parents made you stay. Okay, to listen to me. So sorry. At least I tell good jokes, all right? That's what kids do. I have a daughter. She's almost 11 years old, and she just, there's something inside of her, and she's not like this big tree tree climber, but when she sees this tree, she's like, I just, I want to climb that tree. It's like kids are mesmerized to do things like that. But see, adults, we kind of lose that, don't we? We lose that ability to just kind of cast away everything, And just be a kid. But see, Zacchaeus became like a child so that he could see Jesus. Now, for an adult to become like a child, what does one have to do? I want us to really think about this for a minute. If you are going to become like a child... What do you have to do? Not, not just talking about climbing trees. You're like, well, we got to get the right shoes and wear some gloves, right? we got to get all padded up and everything. No, 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 no. If you're just going to become like a child, what does an adult have to do? Well, you have to not care what others think, right? You just kind of have to forget, listen, I don't, I don't care what they think. I'm going to, dude, have you seen that tree? I am going to go climb that tree. Why? I don't know because I want to go climb a tree. Okay, so you just have to not care what other people think. How about forget about danger and consequences? 
How many times in our adult lives do are we are we faced with something and go, ah, yeah, you know, and you're running through the list of why that's a terrible idea. That's a good thing. Okay, don't not do that. Okay, I, as you guys know, I just had a birthday yesterday. I turned 49, by the way. Okay, this is my last year in my 40s. All right, and. Okay, I used to skate when I was a kid, right? Skateboard, I used to skate ramp and and street and everything, okay? I still have a problem when I see a skateboard, I want to jump on it and see if I can still do a kickflip. And the answer to that question is yes. Now, but there is this thing inside of me that says, is this really a good idea? Like, you do know that on Sunday, you will have to stand in front of a couple hundred people with a broken arm, right? You know that, right? And so, about half the time, I resist the urge to try a kickflip on the skateboard. The other half, I just fail. But see, you have to not care. You have to just throw away that danger or consequences. I don't really care what happens. I'm not really thinking about that because what's set in front of me is fun. Because it looks beneficial of that thing that's right in front of me. I'm just going to go for it and do it. And also, one last thing, you've got to take great risks. If if you're an adult and you want to become like a child, you just got to just, you got to take risks because that's what kids do. And I'm not saying that in life you should be more like a kid and be more irresponsible. Maybe some of us. Maybe some of us could loosen up just a little bit, okay? But for the most part... My EMT workers in here, I'm trying not to look at them right now. They're like, no, go ahead because, you know, we like the work and, you know, all that. But, okay, but it's good to assess what could happen, but it's also good at times to take risks. And I think as adults, we, we've been burned before. We are a little more hesitant because, oh, I know what happens after this. I, I know if I do that thing, and, and even it's a good thing, I, I, uh, see, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if I want to go to that life group, I don't know if I want to go to church, I don't, I don't, I just don't know, I, I, I've seen those types of people before, and see, we, we, we resist taking a risk sometimes. Hold your place there in Luke 19, flip over to Matthew chapter 18. I've never thought of it this succinctly as when I was studying this, this week, and this is hit me like a ton of bricks this week. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 1, it says this, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Verse 2, He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Of heaven. Now, we're going to keep on reading, but I just want us to pause and just let that sink in. Think of that verse right there when you're thinking about Zacchaeus. Doesn't give a rip about what people are thinking. Runs and climbs a tree just because he wanted to see Jesus. So I want to ask you, what are you throwing away? Like, like, what are you like, I just don't care. I'm going to take a risk and just go fully after Jesus. Is that you? Are, are, are you just saying, you know what, I, 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 I just don't care. Jesus, you are the most important thing. I don't care about what it's going to cost me. I don't care about what it's going to change in my life. Jesus, you are what I want to see, so I'm going to follow you with everything really brings this whole concept of becoming like a little child. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And I wrote this down in my notes. Zacchaeus threw off every restraint to get as close to Jesus as he possibly could. I wonder what it would look like in our lives if we did that. If we just, you know what, whatever is holding you back from going in, both feet just jumping into the deep end. I wonder what it would look like in your life if you just threw that off and you wholeheartedly followed Jesus. 
Back to Luke chapter 19, verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Now, realize it doesn't tell us that Zacchaeus was up in the tree going, Jesus, Jesus, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. Look what I can do. You know, he wasn't doing that. He was like, just, just wanted to catch a glimpse. And Jesus stopped and looked up and called him out by name. One commentary said this, because Zacchaeus worked hard and risked embarrassment to see Jesus, Jesus saw him and did not pass him by. Now, he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. And he said, I must stay at your house today. Now, that's just like, hey, I'm gonna, I want to go hang out with you for a little bit. This is, we believe, more written like, hey, I'm going to come to your house. I'm going to stay the night. We're going to have a meal together, and I'm actually going to sleep at your house tonight. It was a very hospitable culture back then. Um, when, when a guest came into town, they would often get invited to, the, to a house. And Jesus was actually inviting himself into Zacchaeus's house, I believe, so that he could actually stay the night. It's another, I think it's like 18 or 19 miles from Jericho to Jerusalem. So Jesus would have needed a place to stay. And this is the only time in scripture that it says Jesus invited himself to stay at a house, to go to a house. Now, can you imagine that? I mean, let's just think about that. What if Jesus came and wanted to stay at your house for the night? If you had a little bit of lead time, especially ladies, would you go home and pick up the house a little bit? You'd probably vacuum and mop the floors, st- like, like do the whole thing where you open the closet and you shove everything in there and pray that Jesus does it. I mean, dude, Jesus has x-ray vision, dude. He can see in your closet, okay? All right. But like, imagine that. Imagine Jesus coming over to your house. And then you have to cook for Jesus. Now, that's terrifying. All right, I, I tell you this all the time. I love to cook. And I love to cook for people. Actually, that, that is just one of the things I absolutely love to do. Can you imagine how Zacchaeus felt that he got to go cook a meal and have a meal with Jesus? Like, what, I, I just, I'm like, I'm geeking out. Like, what, do you, what did he cook? You know, like, like, what was his signature meal? Was it like... I don't know, he's like chicken parmesan or, you know, something like we would think. My signature meal is steak, so Jesus would probably get a steak. Um, But just saying, can you imagine that? Can you imagine Jesus wanting to come to your house? And again, just in this culture of hospitality, again, I can't stress this enough. To sit and have a meal with somebody was so intimate. It, it, was, it was so um, relational. They didn't just, you know, flippantly sit there and watch TV or something. It, it would have been this time where they commune with each other and talk with each other and talk about life and build relationship. And that's what Zacchaeus got to do with Jesus. That's pretty awesome. Revelation chapter 3.20, I said this is the only time that Jesus actually invited himself into someone's house. But Revelation 3.20 says this. This is Jesus speaking. It says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. This is just this awesome picture that Jesus is outside of the door of your house or really more of your life. And he's knocking on that door because he wants to come in. He's not going to open the door and just walk in himself. But he is there ready for people to accept him into their house. He's like, and hey, if if anyone opens the door and asks me to come in, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to have a meal with them. We're going to have communion. We're going to have relationship. That's what Jesus wants from us. Jesus pursues people. Jesus isn't, you know, God in, in the human flesh, but, you know, he's just looking for us to mess up because he's, you know, ready to whack us with this big stick because, you know, Jesus isn't all about rules. He's like, hey, follow all of my rules and, and you know, or else. It, that's not what Jesus is. Jesus is pursuing us in a way that he just wants relationship. 
Now, do we follow the rules? Not because Jesus is this big ultimate rule giver, because he gave us those rules and ways to live because he knows that's the best thing for us. But Jesus pursues people. Verse six, so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Man, so cool. Verse seven, all the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now, kind of the story shifts a little bit, doesn't it? And here we have everybody chiming in, giving their opinion. You know who's often really, really good at giving their opinion? Us Christians, right? This probably would have been some of the religious leaders. Maybe there were some Pharisees there. And, and the, but they're all judging Jesus because, like, no, 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 no. You don't go hang out with a sinner, right? As if, like, they're not. Okay, yes, they call tax collectors a whole other category of a sinner. But we see all throughout the life of Jesus, that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't go hang out with the religious leaders. He hung out with the sinners. He hung out with the people who needed a savior, who needed a doctor to cure their disease of sin. Now, Again, all the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. I want to give you a really super theological truth, okay? Because you you can't get away from this. This is going to happen. So you may want to write this down. This is super deep. You ready? Haters going to hate. All right? Yes, I stole that from Taylor Swift, but it's true. You're always going to have people who are going to complain and whine and tell you you're doing the wrong thing. Guess what? Just keep your eyes focused on Jesus. That's just, just, just drown out all the rest of the noise. And no, Jesus, this is, I am following what you have me to do. The moment we care more about what people think than what God thinks, we've lost sight of what is truly important. When we start caring more about what people think than what God thinks, that's it. We've lost. We've lost right there. Proverbs 29, 25 says, fear of man will prove to be a snare. When, when we fear people more than we feel God, fear God, guess what? It's going to be a snare. It's a trap. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Back to verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, now pause just for a second. You, you got to get this. We don't know specifically when this happened because the story doesn't say, oh, they got to the house and they were having the meal or Jesus was hanging out with them. It, 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 they could still be standing right there in the street when, you know, Jesus could have been helping Zacchaeus down the tree. We don't know. But, but there was this moment, I call it this aha moment, where Zacchaeus just got it. He, he just finally realized, oh my goodness, this guy is forgiving me. Like this guy would even want to hang out with me. Nobody wants to hang out with me. Nobody wanted to be around Zacchaeus. Everyone hated Zacchaeus. They didn't even see him as a Jew anymore. He was outcast. And Jesus, this guy who might be the Messiah, they thought, was going to go hang out with Zacchaeus. So Zacchaeus had this massive aha moment. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, I don't have time to break it all down or get into it or even give you verses. I'm just going to tell you what he is doing here is he is referencing the Levitical law, the Mosaic law. And there was laws instituted for how much restitution you had to give. If you wronged somebody, if you took something, you had to repay them back this much. And then if you couldn't pay back this, you had to pay them back this much. And there were all of these laws and rules set up. So so, uh, Zacchaeus remembers back in like Sunday school when he used to sort of be a practicing Jew or maybe his parents drug him to, you know, uh, church or whatever. And he's like, I remember this from the law that I'm supposed to pay people back this much. He's like, you know what? I'm going to even go greater and beyond that and be excessive 
about how much I give back. That's what Jesus or uh, Zacchaeus was doing here. He had this aha moment like, I have wronged people, and I have to do whatever it takes, no matter if it costs me everything. I've got to do whatever it takes to make it right. Giving, generosity, works, anything that you can do, it's so important to understand this before this next verse. They have nothing to do with salvation, okay? You cannot earn your salvation. I say it like this. You can't do anything to add to God's grace. God's grace is so good, you can't add to it. What Zacchaeus was doing, he was demonstrating his salvation, not working for his salvation. He said, you know what? I will give it all up because this is more important. Now, in light of that, verse nine, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. Why did he say that? This man too is the son of Abraham. Remember, because nobody even considered him a Jew anymore. And this was Jesus's way of welcoming him back into the family of God. But he said, today, this day, salvation has come to this house. It didn't mean his whole family got saved because of the actions, because of the heart change of Zacchaeus. That's not what that means. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. So that's not what this verse means. A lot of people think that. It just means God's salvation has come to this man in this house. And oftentimes, that salvation will spread because of the joy that we have in our hearts. But Jesus said, today, salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. And then we get to the next verse. Verse 10. For the son of man, Jesus declares this about himself. That son of man, that that was the most common term that Jesus would call himself. That was kind of his title that he would say. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Now I'm going to make a very, very bold statement right here. You ready? This is quite possibly, and in my opinion, probably is the most valuable, best, most important, most glorious verse in all of Scripture. This one verse right here, and by the way, this story is only recorded in the book of Luke. It doesn't say this anywhere else. Sometimes we have the stories in three or four of them. This is only recorded in Luke, but I believe this verse right here is probably the most important verse in all of Scripture. Why? Why do you say that? Because this was Jesus' mission statement. This is what Jesus was all about. This is why he came to earth, to seek and to save the lost. Now, there's three really important words here that I want to break down, and we're done real fast here, okay? Now, I say this a lot. When you are reading, when you are doing your own Bible study, I want to challenge you not to... Um, just read a whole chapter, and and I'm not saying don't do that, but what is way more valuable in just getting your check and reading a chapter is just picking a passage and looking at it, maybe a small passage, looking at it, dissecting it, seeing what it means. Like, I, I I could preach for weeks on this one verse because it is so rich. So, and, and, and what, we're getting ready to do with something that I tell you guys to do all the time. When you come to a verse, Luke 19.10, you go in, you Google search Luke 19.10 lexicon, L-E-X-I-C-O-N. That will bring it back to the original Greek, and you will be able to see what those words mean. We have three huge words in this verse, and it's, it brings this verse to life when we really understand what Jesus is saying. So here we go. The first word is seek. And this word seek means to seek by inquiring, to investigate, to reach a binding resolution, to search, getting to the bottom of a matter. Now that's a little deeper than just going and looking for something, right? Now, now again, picture this. This is what Jesus does. He didn't just go out and, you know, whoever he ran across, you know, he would share the gospel with, and he did that too. But most of the time, it was a divine appointment, like the woman at the well, right? 
That was a divine appointment. That's what Jesus did. Jesus sought us out in such a way that he was going to resolve it. He was going to inquire and get to the bottom. Of it. I wrote it down this way. Seeking something so thoroughly that the matter is fully resolved. That's how Jesus seeks us. In Ezekiel, a prophet of hundreds and hundreds of years earlier, in Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11, 12, he says this. For this is what the sovereign Lord says. So this prophet Ezekiel is, is speaking on behalf of God. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. Hundreds of years were written before this. And Ezekiel's basically saying the exact same thing that Jesus is saying in verse 10 here. The sovereign Lord has come to seek and save what was lost. So that's the first one, seek. Our second word is, of course, save. This word means to deliver out of danger and into safety, used principally of God rescuing believers from the penalty and power of sin and into his provisions. So he's not just saving them in a way that, oh, oh, good, you're out of, no, like, like Jesus is like, no, 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 you're mine now. Like, I am saving you from the penalty of sin. Like, I know what is in store for you without me, and I want to save you from that. That's what Jesus does. He seeks and he saves. I want to call the band back up on the stage. As we look at our last word, and that's lost. And this is what lost means. This, this one really is what got me. Because we would, we would just think of being lost like I was lost with a van full of students. Or like, you know, you've been out at sea and maybe lost. Or maybe you just couldn't find something temporarily. That's not what this word means. Lost means to destroy. What? That, no, that's not what that means. This word means to destroy. Fully destroy, cutting off entirely violently, completely perish, implies permanent or absolute destruction, i.e., or example, to cancel out or remove, to die with the implication of ruin and destruction, cause to be lost, utterly perish by experiencing a miserable end. Wow. That's a little different than just temporarily misplacing something, isn't it? And, and not to be all doomsday or anything, but without Jesus, that's what you are. You will experience, unfortunately, a miserable end. Uh, you will be utterly destroyed, it says. And that's what Jesus is trying to save you from. He's seeking you out in a way that he says, I love you too much to let you continue to live like that. So I am sometimes going to allow things to happen in your life to get you to put your focus back on me. I'm going to allow you to go through trouble. I'm going to put this person in your way. I'm going to prepare the perfect message for you to hear that Sunday so that you will get it to know that you are lost without Jesus in your life. And this is not just a, a sprinkling of Jesus in your life. This is not just, you know, getting, getting some things fixed in your life. This is not maybe upping your church attendance. This is making Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. Because that's what he requires. Jesus gave everything when he hung on a cross. He shed out all of his blood for you. And to think that we can just give him part of our lives. Oh, Jesus, you can have my Sunday morning or you can have this, but, but you can't have my life fully. I'm not ready to give those things up. I'm really glad Jesus didn't do that for us. He wants to be Lord or master of your life. And that kind of at first glance, it sounds oppressing, but I promise you, when you live by what Jesus is saying in his word, 
it's such a better, blessed life. We're still going to go through all the junk that we do, but man, Jesus is right there to walk alongside of you and to carry you through those things. So would you stand with me? I want to give us all an opportunity this morning to make a decision. That decision might be, hey, today is the day I'm going to get Jesus. I'm going to get this right in my life for the first time. Today is the day that I'm going to give my life to Jesus. But maybe you've done that. Maybe you did that a long, long, long time ago. And maybe you've just kind of been straying away. Maybe you have been a little bit lost. You've kind of been pushing God aside. I want to give you an opportunity this morning to just to turn back to Jesus. I want to, I want to finish with this one last statement. God doesn't make bad things good. That's not what he does. God doesn't just fix some things in your life. That's not why he came. God doesn't make bad things good. He makes dead things come to life. That's what Jesus does. You were dead in your sins, in your trespasses. You had no other options but Jesus as your Savior in your life. That's what it requires. So let's pray. God, we come before you this morning. We're so grateful and thankful that you are the Savior that you have made a way for us to know you, to have a relationship with you, that you would be knocking on our door to come into our house and have a meal with us. God, and to do life with us. Thank you, God, that you pursue us in a way that you want to be our savior. God, I just pray for people in this room right now who do not know you as their personal savior. Right now in this moment, would they just cry out and say, Jesus, I need you. I'm tired of trying to do this on my own. I trust that you died for me. Come into my life. Save me. Change me. I fully give my life to you, Jesus. And like I said earlier, maybe maybe you've done that before. But maybe you've just kind of straight a little bit maybe Jesus isn't front and center in your life right now in this moment I want to give you an opportunity to do that say Jesus I'm sorry I'm sorry I keep running from you God stir in me what you have done before change my heart God I just pray for this church I pray for these people, God, as we have a time of response. God, I just pray that you would work on hearts. May your spirit just move in this place. Do amazing things for the kingdom of God this morning. We pray all of this in the awesome name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, if you this morning, if you need prayer, if you want to pray with somebody, if you want to know what it means to be a child of God, if you know, hey, I just need to come and get on my knees this morning and go straight to God, come forward. We've got people up here that want to talk with you and pray with you.